Welcome to this presentation of the stance of the Coburn Association about the future of Edinburgh, our unique city. My name is Cliff Haig and I'm honoured to be the chair of the association, which was formed back in 1875 to protect and enhance the beauty of Edinburgh, a role that it fulfils to the present day. We're the leading voice of civil society within the city, we're a charity and a membership organisation. Everyone who loves Edinburgh can join us. This presentation was first delivered to our annual general meeting on the 21st of May 2020. A critical moment because the COVID-19 virus has shut down the city and posed some fundamental questions for all of us about what direction offers the best route to recovery. We're pleased to share our current thinking here. At the end of the presentation, you will find details about how you can respond and shape this agenda as we move forward. The Coburn launched its Our Unique City project in the spring of 2019 because we were aware that during 2020 there would be consultation on a new 10-year local development plan for Edinburgh. So often such official consultations seem to be constrained, steering discussion towards ticking boxes to endorse a predetermined set of answers. We believed that citizens had a right to something better than that. So to inform discussion and debate, we produced six thought pieces that explored trends and drivers for the future of Edinburgh. As well as making these papers freely available on our website, we consulted with representatives of community councils and neighbourhood organisations through the Edinburgh Civic Forum, which the Coburn chairs. We also held three open soapbox sessions and we promoted our unique city on social media as well as amongst our members. In the early months of 2020, the City Council came forward with consultation on two important plans, the City Mobility Plan and the new Local Development Plan for the City. In both cases, they contain some good ideas which the Coburn has supported. However, both belong to an era before COVID-19 struck. In the years leading up to 2020, Edinburgh had experienced strong growth. Student numbers were up, tourism numbers were up, population was increasing. The dramatic impact of the pandemic makes it necessary now for us to reimagine the future of the city. We're no longer in January 2020. The virus is changing economies, attitudes and ways of living, and it has exposed inequalities in health and in access to space that previously were glossed over. The Fraser of Allender Institute anticipates that the Scottish economy could shrink by 20 to 25 per cent. This means more unemployment, falling wages and reduced spending power, which will impact here in Edinburgh too. Brexit also means that there are uncertainties about future trading relationships. The Scottish economy is also likely to suffer from plunging oil prices. The price of a barrel of Brent crude fell from $71 in February 2019 down to around $25 in mid-April 2020. In addition to all this, the last year or so has seen growing concerns about climate change. Indeed, the City Council declared a climate emergency and set a, an, an ambitious target of being net zero carbon by 2030. In all of this uncertainty, what endures is the quality of Edinburgh as a place, its landscapes, its buildings, its institutions, in short, its uniqueness. These must be the foundations on which to build our future. That future must be more green, more inclusive, and more inspired by conservation than Edinburgh was in 2019. Because it is a great city, Edinburgh has become an unaffordable place to live for many people. It attracts speculative investment that diminishes housing choice for people in the city, while often draining the returns out of Edinburgh and into the bank accounts of international investors. The house building industry has not delivered the scale of affordable housing that Edinburgh needs. 
In part, this reflects Scottish Government policies that encourage development for student housing and for build to rent. Consequently, we've been building a legacy of accommodation with space inadequate even for normal daily living, let alone for enforced isolation at home. The loss of 12,000 properties to short-term letting, a much higher level in relation to population than is the case in London, also made Edinburgh less affordable in recent years. Planning powers must now be used to prevent conversion of whole properties into short-term lets. Cutting back on carbon also means shifting the gaze from new house building to conservation and improvement of the existing stock and from the previous reactive numerical target driven approach to one focused on making high quality living environments for all. The embedded carbon in existing buildings should be concerned, conserved as an alternative to new build. An active drive for repair and conservation will also maximise recirculation of investment within the local economy and support local jobs. The lockdown has shown how important it is to have local green space, especially in areas that are short of private open space. The health benefits of an attractive local environment should be available to all citizens. We should no longer view green spaces as a liability to be disposed of. Green networks and design for walkability are themes supported in the mobility plan and these prin principles need to be embedded in a plan for any post-pandemic recovery. For example, a Queensbury to Joppa linear green path could be an inspiring project with potential benefits to areas in the north of the city where cumulative disadvantages show up in poorer health and life expectancy. Jobs, health and green. It ticks a lot of the boxes that need to be addressed in this decade. Before the pandemic, Edinburgh was a prosperous city, but the growth policies had widened inequalities within and beyond Edinburgh. The city will enter the recovery period with important economic strengths that can be built upon, but also with even deeper inequalities than before. Jobs and wages will have been lost, and this will have a negative economic multiplier effect, particularly on consumer services. The many public sector jobs, notably in health, education and public administration, will have an important role to play in this coming decade. In addition, a proactive response to the climate emergency should be the priority for job creation and business growth. More home-based teleworking is likely to impact on future demand for office floor space and to change travel patterns. Choices for City Plan 2030 expects the strong demand for office space to continue, but will it? Most of Edinburgh's office market is in the mid-market range, but small and medium-sized companies, sadly, are the ones least able to ride out this economic disaster. Choices for City Plan 2030 acknowledges that, to quote, there is spare retail capacity within the city. However, the statement that, to quote, Edinburgh's city centre and town centres are in a healthy condition with very low vacancy rates in comparison to many Scot uh, across Scotland suggests a complacency that may now need to be reconsidered. The eventual opening of the St James Quarter development is likely to have further adverse impacts on retail activity on Princess Street. We should be thinking of ways to come out of this crisis by making sustainable communities an essential part of a new Edinburgh and not just an empty phrase. Local place plans may be a way to work up ideas for integrated local centres that could combine retail with residential, office, small manufacturing or workshops and with key services such as health, childcare or youth support for example. The COVID virus has created a crisis in public transport use because of fears of infection in confined and crowded spaces. This has serious implications here in Edinburgh 
particularly in relation to sustaining bus services and suppressing car use in the city. The global fall in oil prices, along with the reflationary cut in fuel tax which might happen that could make petrol cheaper and hence make car use a more attractive option. Given the existing pressures on the limited space in the city centre, it's not easy to see how or where additional vehicles could be accommodated. Internationally, the lockdown has triggered a flurry of local government efforts to reallocate road space to pedestrians and cyclists, for example by widening pavements or creating new cycle lanes. Such innovations make places safer, greener and more inclusive. Here in Edinburgh, they pose two questions. Is there the political will? And if there is, will the detailed design be of a high quality and informed by the local knowledge of citizens? We raise the second question because design was given no thought in the summer streets interventions during the 2019 Edinburgh Festival, and this resulted in a visual and functional mess. How well equipped is Edinburgh for a switch to electronic vehicles, including e-bikes and e-scooters, driverless vehicles, all innovations that are now coming into play and likely to become more significant by 2030. These new modes of connecting should be factored into the city plans. The COVID-19 virus has caused a sudden and dramatic change in circumstances. This means that previous predictions of housing demand should now be reassessed. To give one example, more home working and fewer trips to the office could result in people being willing to commute further in order to get more space in and around the home. A two hour journey twice a week from a distant small town might replace a one hour trip five times a week from somewhere closer. This could extend the geography of Edinburgh's housing market. The house building industry will take time to recover from this crisis. Blockages in supply chains of materials and labour are potential consequences of the shutdown and of UK changes in trading and immigration rules following Brexit. Combining these factors with the number of existing planning permissions suggests that there is likely to be sufficient land with planning permissions already to satisfy the capacity of the industry to deliver. There's no market case for major greenfield land releases at the present time. More weight now needs to be attached to biodiversity when it comes to development decisions. The COBA believes that in the decade ahead, the priority should be to reuse brownfield land in and around the city. This is indeed one of the three options advanced in the Choices for City Plan 2030 consultation, though the authors of that document say that it would mean a step change. We now need a step change. Our tangible and intangible heritage has drawn ever increasing number of visitors and in turn the city has sought to stay competitive in the global market by fabricating more attractions to the point where the authenticity of the heritage has itself been compromised. Suddenly festivals are cancelled, cruise ships are docked, hotels are empty. Whose heritage and whose city will be affirmed during this coming decade. There was a consultation on the future tourism strategy in November and December of 2019. It went some way towards recognising the challenges faced by the industry. For example, it promised we will nurture and cherish our place and set ambitions including one that to quote, Edinburgh's heritage is cherished and cared for as a fundamental aspect of the city's character. And another was that new tourism developments will contribute to the quality of life for local people. So the recipe was actually for more tourist developments with the industry playing to quote again, a more active role in the development and delivery of the World Heritage Site Management Plan. When the responses to the consultation came in, giving the wrong answers, they were dismissed. Yet just a matter of weeks later, 
The prospects for tourism in Edinburgh, as elsewhere, have been turned on their head. Festivals have been cancelled, international travel has been trimmed to a minimum, even day trips are out. Most informed commentators expect tourism to be a sector suffering badly and for more than just the short term. This is clearly a concern because many jobs in Edinburgh are indeed contingent on tourism and the festivals and the culture have been a key part of the tourism brand. Despite much focal public concern in recent years about over-tourism, the City Plan 2030 consultation document has little to say about the capacity of the city and especially its residential city centre to absorb tourist numbers. What it does say gives little sense that there are serious issues to be addressed. It proposes a new policy that would, to quote, provide support for Edinburgh's festivals and cultural offerings across the city and sees this as a way of promoting, again to quote, good growth, close quote. This is simply not good enough. As the Christmas market saga demonstrated, such cultural offerings, especially in the World Heritage Site, should be a concern for the statutory planning system and properly regulated. There is an opportunity now for Edinburgh to rethink its strategy for tourism. More is not always better. Empty hotels made it possible to take homeless people off the streets. A crisis was relieved by a crisis. In line with the themes running throughout the Our Unique City documents, festival and cultural events could be dispersed around the city to strengthen local places and celebrate their distinct histories and qualities of place and residence. Conservation areas are heritage assets and should be supported in every way. Decking over parks and green spaces for major events must now be a thing of the past. Moving towards the conclusions, it's important to recognise that resilience should not be about bouncing back, but about bouncing forwards. We've learnt a number of things from this crisis that we can't have economic health unless we also have public health and well-being. That a decade of growth has left Edinburgh still with 80,000 of its citizens living in poverty, many of them doing vital work, yet most at risk during this pandemic. We also know that recovery in Edinburgh, fortunately, is likely to be easier than in many other cities. And this is because of existing strengths that the city has in sections, sectors such as research and financial services. However, the prospects are more problematic in respect to retailing, culture and tourism. We now know that this is what a crisis looks like, but the climate crisis is still with us and a prospect ahead. What is needed then is a new perspective on Edinburgh, its governance, its communities, its way to, ways to do things. We believe there's more future in localism, in supporting local identities, boosting social cohesion within those communities and across the city, and in community wealth building. And we think you can do this by capitalising upon some of the trends that are there already, but also by being innovative in other ways. More home working can strengthen local communities and reduce travel. Local mixed use, multi-purpose neighbourhood hoods, hubs are an idea that we're putting forward. The whole focus needs now to be upon conservation, maintenance and improvement of what we have. We should cherish local public spaces and be actively creating new ones. We need to rediscover respect for our streets and that make the places that they serve work for children, for the elderly and the disabled. And we suggest that we can build upon the festivals, but let's decentralise them and let's stagger them. The book festival, for example, does not have to go at the same time as the main festivals. The film festival 
and the Science Festival have successfully run at other times of the year. In all of this, we need to make Edinburgh a greener city. And we think that more localism, less travel, enhanced green spaces, better maintenance and conservation, all these things support transition to a greener city. The Council's net zero carbon target by 2030 should be taken seriously and embedded across all policy areas. It shouldn't just be seen as one of a number of policy choices which officials can decide which ones to prioritise. We also need to begin to take design much more seriously and set and demand high standards at every level from the way we handle street closures up to major developments. And finally, we need to build on the assets, the physical assets and the human assets that make this city great and create research and learning loops through connecting across traditional divides. Will it happen? Well, we do have some concerns. There's a fear that the back to normal blinkers are already on. The Tourism Strategy Implementation Group made up of a majority of members of the industry and a selection of leading officials and councillors. This group is again meeting behind closed doors. There's been no opening up to the wider civic voice. We're also seeing more delegation to leading officials and politicians as a crisis measure, but one that sets a precedent that we are concerned may be run, run forward once the crisis is passed. Also, after the financial crash of 2008, the city rushed to attract developers, setting the bar low in terms of expectations. Could that happen again? Scottish Government also comes into this equation. And again, seeing Edinburgh as a major driver of the Scottish economy, are they going to be more relaxed about requirement, for example, for public engagement in planning? as has already happened as a crisis measure. Or, again, they've delayed the low emission zone implementation in Edinburgh. All these, we think, are valid concerns and demand a watchful voice from our civic society. Finally, a reminder that the Coburn exists for everyone who loves Edinburgh and bears the name of Lord Coburn, who, back in 1849, wrote that there are some who see nothing valuable in a city except what they think convenience. They would hold a town to be a mere collection of houses, shops and streets. This class exists and from its activity and imperviousness is always to be feared. Let's just remember that as we face and plan for our future in this unique city. Thank you.